Now we're going to put this, the pattern back into storage. This is num pattern number 2927. So we'll go in and catalog it, put it back on the shelf where it came from. Back in my grandfather's time, the building was called the Pattern Loft, and it was just a storage area for the patterns that were going to be used and those that were made, because you never knew when you were going to have to use them again. And we're going to put this one back on the shelf for future use, because they would have in the old days. As you can see, there's, there's patterns for almost every kind of a machine that they was used in the mines in the early days. There were uh, ball mill ball patterns, which had uh, half a ball on each side, and and they uh, were used for grinding ore. There are various sizes of those. Uh, these were patterns for, for gears that were made here. The, that pinion gear would drive against a gear similar to this to change the speed of whatever it is they were using it for. Like these were, were grates for, uh, for the old wood stove. And, uh, so you can see they made parts for almost everything that needed cast iron Again, they made uh, ca castings out of brass, aluminum, and, and iron, gray iron, and uh, they were mainly famous for their mud pumps in the early days. They made, they were made out of hard iron, and uh, they lasted a long time. And they, uh, they were sold all over the world, also. Uh, but one of the biggest drawbacks to that was the uh, freight was the killer. It cost too much to send it. Yeah, there are several thousand patterns. I think they had a, had a catalog and they had a, of the different mining companies and they had all the patterns were written on them as to what company they were for and what they were piece of equipment they were used on and they had a number on them and then they'd go through and had the different shelves and it would be cataloged like a library would be and you can go and find those things you need but without the catalog you'd, uh, it's kind of a hunt and peck deal to try to figure out where parts or where the patterns are for the different machines that you might want to rebuild from for whatever reason. Do you ever get tempted to wish that your grandfather's ghost could come and like give you the pattern? <laughs> yeah sometimes at night you're kind of wondering once in a while as to if there isn't a ghost of my grandfather. He got was killed here by in a windstorm putting tin back on the roof and in the pattern shop there was a pattern maker was was killed making a, a pattern on the lathe and uh, so they're liable to be some old ghosts around here that you just kind of hope they're proud of you rather than being mad at you for whatever it is you've done to their, their earlier times. With the pattern put away, the final step of the process would have been to take the metal casting to the machine shop for smoothing out on the lathe. Earlier we saw the, the pattern and the molding of it in the foundry and this is the, re, the end result of, of what it would have been after then it was brought to the machine shop for for finished machining and this lathe was uh, it's a Cincinnati it's had a lot of wear and tear over the years but it's it still works fine I'm gonna line it up and uh, take a cut off of it now, this is my lining up board it's a piece of small piece of wood with a file on it the edge and what we do is just spin it around and look down the edge of the file and see which way it needs to go and then you can just pull it back and forth and push it push it back and forth around. The machine shop is powered uh, with a seven horse motor up in the rafters on this uh, from that uh, seven horse motor over there is located and then uh, on this big wooden pulley it's driven and uh, we'll go start it up here for you. The gearing on the lathe, this, this is a back gear and then you can, you, you vary the speed also with by changing the, the, we'll go from a larger pulley to a smaller pulley or back and forth. Uh, and it's got a clutch on this one, some of them have idler pulleys and drive pulleys. A little bit slower than they are today, but it still works works fine. Also, it's, we were tempted a few times when uh, business was good to put a little more modern machine in, but the machine never came, and the, the cost was never there that warranted it. So we just stayed with the old machines. Uh, 
they're still in good shape. It makes quite a bit of noise, for, but it kind of harmony after a while. But it's all powered on 480 volt power. It's different working with old equipment, and it uh, kind of gives you a tie to the past and, and how things were then versus the, how they are today. Uh, I kind of enjoy it. And I'm proud of the fact that uh, we've been able to serve the country and or the area with the, the services we have. I guess we'll be here the rest of my life. With all the first-hand knowledge John Campbell has acquired over the years, he's become an invaluable resource at the adjacent Tonopah Mining the Park. To, to drive speed We've got a lot of um, equipment that's still in here that is usable to this day. You could, all you'd need is what, an engine and just start this up and get everything running? Turn the power on or turn the switch on and it should go. It's, it's just amazing. It is amazing that, you know, something like this can sit here for years and years, just idle, collecting dust, and uh, just be ready to go at a moment's notice. So when, when you're looking for a uh, place to go, a vacation spot, a weekend getaway, you want to come to Tonopah. You want to see the sights, you want to see the history and the people that are here and talk to them. You'll get a great lesson and you'll love it and you'll want to come back again. The Tonopah Mining Park is, is a fantastic tourist attraction. It's really been a remarkable evolution, seeing a, a small effort turn into a, a growing concern. It attracts people because it's magic. They have fantastic resources there and they've been rehabilitating them step by step, partly with the help of the Commission for Cultural Affairs, but also with just a lot of local enthusiasm. We're very proud of what they've accomplished. Please join us in preserving and celebrating our state's colorful heritage. Call 775-684-3448 or visit us at nevadaculture.org. Besides administering grants, the Preservation Office maintains state and national registers of historic places and runs the State Historic Marker Program. The Preservation Office is part of the Nevada Department of Cultural Affairs, along with the State Library and Archives, Nevada Arts Council, and Division of Museums and History. Through these agencies, the State of Nevada offers a wealth of cultural programs for residents and visitors alike. We invite you to check out our website or call 775 687-8323 in Carson City. And see you next time on Exploring Nevada.